thank you very much. I would like uh, to thank the organizers. It's a pleasure. Uh, the great, uh, it's always a, a great pleasure to, to come to Trieste. Uh, I <laughs> think like many people said, it also was uh, uh, one of my my first uh, in, in, uh, international conference, so uh, so it's, it's always a, a great pleasure being here. And so, uh, uh, so I'll talk about some works in progress uh, about the trying to give a global picture of a global description of the fractal geometry of the fractal geometric properties of a typical horseshoe, a typical hyperbolic set, or at least of a typical horseshoe in arbitrary dimensions so for a dissipative dynamical system. And um, so you know that uh, many, uh, well, many dynamical systems are not uniformly hyperbolic, but it's quite, quite often uh, even uh, uh, dynamical systems which are not hyperbolic uh, contains subsystems which are hyperbolic. But, uh, uh, typically, they contain a lot of periodic orbit, and, and in many cases, uh, non-trivial uh, invariant sets contain uh, non-trivial hyperbolic sets. In particular, the, uh, uh, quite often, non-trivial invariant sets by uh, dynamical systems contain uh, Hochschuls, contain hyperbolic sets which uh, with uh, zero topological dimension, but uh, which can have, uh, say, large fractal dimension. And, and we try to understand the geometry of, of such hyperbolic sets, of, of Hochschuls, uh, as, as well as, as possible uh, for typical, say, infinity dynamics. Uh, so it's a talk about uh, uniformly hyperbolic dynamics, but about some geometrical problems which are still not very well understood. For instance, some very basic questions, for instance, about uh, the typical continuity of fractal dimensions of uh, Hochschuls or of stable and unstable Cantor sets associated to Hochschuls are still uh, uh, open. And, and what, what are the uh, the good uh, f f f f notions of, of fractal dimensions you should use for typical Hochschuls is, is also not completely clear in general. So we'll try to, to give some, some answers to, 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 to these questions. So let's start with uh, uh, a very well-known case of dimension two, of Hochschuls in dimension two which are important to understand bifurcations of hyperbolic dynamics in dimension two. So uh, at least personally, I began uh, studying this subject motivated by the study of homoclinic bifurcations in dimension two. So I will recall very briefly s uh, some of the, the, the history of, of, of this problem. So, uh, uh, the, so here we have a, a, a Hochschule there. Let's see how, how it, it works. It, it, it has a light somewhere. Let's see, see? No, pardon. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, here. Yeah. This one? <laughs> OK. Voila. OK. So. So this is a Hochschule, and here we create a first homoclinic tangency associated to the, to the Hochschule, and then we unfold the tangency, we want to see what happens for a small positive values of the parameter, and this is what happens uh, after the bifurcation. We may create a lot of new tangencies. Well, indeed, it depends a lot on the geometry of the original Hochschule. Uh, well, in, indeed, uh, new tangencies essentially correspond to intersections of Cantor sets in a real line. So, have a, if you extend these stable and unstable laminations to 
foliations defined in the neighborhoods of them. Then, then uh, we have a line of tangency, so a line where the, the laminations can have some uh, non-trivial tangencies, this, this line here. And so uh, if we consider these holonomies, we have uh, two cantor sets, a red cantor set and a blue cantor set, so a stable, uh, so the images of stable and unstable cantor sets in this line, which are moving when we unfold the bifurcation. And we want to understand whether these cantor sets intersect uh, often or not. And this is, a, in first approximation, is related to understanding the uh, size of the arithmetic difference of the, these two cantor sets. If one of the two cantor sets is fixed and the other moves uh, with constant, constant speed, the set of parameters for which they have non-empty intersection is the uh, arithmetic difference. And if the, the Hochschule is, is, is small, so if the house of dimension of the Hochschule, which in dimension two is the sum of the house of dimension of both cantor sets, if it is smaller than one, uh, then this arithmetic difference is a small set, is a set of house of dimension smaller than one and of zero Lebesgue measure in this, uh, in this line. So it means that uh, for most parameters, we don't have intersections between this cantor set, and indeed it implies uh, it, uh, uh, this fact was used by uh, Jacob in, in Flores Takens, by Palis and Takens, to show that uh, in a typical homoclinic bifurcation associated to a small Hochschule, a Hochschule with dimensions smaller than one, uh, indeed for uh, with full Lebesgue density at the initial bifurcation parameter, uh, th there is hyperbolicity. So there is pre prevalence of hyperbolicity at the initial bifurcation parameter. So new homoclinic tangencies are very rare in this situation. On the other hand, when the house of dimension of the Hochschule is larger than one, then uh, the arithmetic difference typically uh, uh, has non-empty interior. So typically, you have uh, non-empty intervals of persistent tangencies, and indeed this corresponds to open sets in the parameter with positive Lebesgue density corresponding to Neuhaus phenomena, to uh, persistent homoclinic tangencies. So the geometry of the Hochschule uh, is very much related to the, uh, to, to, uh, to, to the bifurcation diagram, to understanding the prevalent uh, uh, dynamical behavior after the uh, first homoclinic bifurcation. So, <clears throat> but, so understanding, so, so a main problem here was to understand these uh, arithmetic differences, or, or more precisely, these intersections of contour sets in the real line. So, uh, indeed, it, uh, so the, this result about uh, the case when the sum of the house dimension is larger than one was a joint work with Yokoz in 2001. So we showed that typically when the sum of the house of dimensions of two regular cantor sets in the real line is larger than one, then almost every position of intersection is a position of stable intersection, which means that uh, if you move a little bit the, the pair of cantor sets or even if we change a little bit the dynamics which define the cantor sets, they still have non-empty intersection. So we have like a transversal intersection in some sense. So it's some sort of a fractal transversality phenomenon. Uh, and in other words, we show, so we can uh, reformulate this result with, with your course in order to show that if you have a, a Hochschule with dimension larger than one, then typical projections of the Hochschule to the real line, or typical images of the Hochschule by differentiable functions, have typically non-empty interior in the real line, uh, in a persistent way. So uh, if you perturb a little bit the, the function in the C1 topology, it still has non-empty interior. 
Uh, and, and this is open in the C1 plus epsilon topology in the Hochschule. It's dense in the C infinity topology and open in C1 plus something topology, C1 plus epsilon for some positive epsilon, but it's not open in the, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, the, the, this result is not true in the C1 topology. For, for typical uh, C1 Hochschule's, uh, the, the projections will be Cantor sets, but this is another story. But uh, this is a typical phenomenon in higher topology. So it's, uh, it's dense in C infinite topology. It's open in C1 plus epsilon topology. So uh, it's a reasonably good result in this context, but uh, it's, it's not. Uh, uh, so it's, it's C1 open in the projection, so the, the map which projects in the real line can be C1 and can be perturbed in, in the C1 topology, but not the Hochschule. We need the, at le, the, the dynamic to be at least C2 uh, in this context, but uh, in the results I will describe later, uh, C1 will be enough. Okay, but so... What happened about the geometry of Hochschule in, in dimension two? Well, uh, the house of dimension of, of uh, Hochschule in dimension two is equal to the sum of the, the house of dimensions of the stable and unstable Cantor sets. A stable Cantor set is an intersection of the Hochschule with a local uh, stable manifold, and an unstable Cantor set is an intersection with a local unstable manifold. And, well, it depends on the choice of the manifold, but indeed, all these intersections are diffeomorphic because the holonomies are, are, are nice. The holonomies are at least C1, indeed C1 plus something, C1 plus epsilon, if the Hochschule is at least C2, for instance. So the, the situation is quite nice in the uh, geometric point of view. The house of dimension depends continuously, even in the C1 topology, the house of dimension of, of the of the of Hochschule's in dimension two. Uh, okay, but the situation, so the this talk is about higher dimension, dimension higher than one. But in some sense, this result with your cause uh, this result with your cause gives some uh, some tools which at least uh, psychologically are important in the development of the uh, results I will describe in, in higher dimensions. So the, the, at least the structure of the, of the proofs, uh, the, uh, so the technique of, of the proofs are uh, clearly inspired in the, uh, in the proof of this result with your cause. And indeed, we have two main uh, ingredients in, in the, the proof of this theorem, which solve the conjecture by by Jacopalis, no? that typically uh, for counter sets on the real line, so if the dimension is smaller than one, then, then the arithmetic difference is very small, has zero Lebesgue measure, and if the sum of dimension is larger than one, then they have a lot of stable intersections, the arithmetic difference typically has non-empty interior, so have a, a quite precise dichotomy in the sense for, for most pairs, for an open and dense set of pairs of regular Cantor sets on the real line. So the main techniques in the proof of these results are first the uh, establishment of a criterion, also of a con uh, sufficient condition which implies uh, stable intersection, which is uh, uh, sufficient for, to, to guarantee that two Cantor sets on the real line have an intersection that we cannot destroy uh, by changing a little bit the pair of Cantor sets. And then we need to show that this condition is satisfied by most pairs of Cantor sets uh, whose sum of dimension is larger than one. And here we use a version of Erdos probabilistic uh, method in the sense that we, well, we have two C infinity Cantor sets on the real line. We will uh, make a perturbation to one of them, we fix one of the Cantor sets, and, make a perturbation to the other one in order to create stable intersections. In, indeed, in order to the new pair of Cantor sets to satisfy this recurrent compact set criterion that we introduced before. So the, 
these perturbations are not uh, quite explicit. Indeed, what we do is to create a family of perturbations with a very large number of parameters and to prove that for most parameters, uh, the perturbation works. So for most parameters, indeed, we, we are creating a recurrent compact set and, and everything will, uh, will work. But so uh, this, in, in some sense, th this ingredient, so this philosophy will still uh, be present in the results I will describe now. So let's start discussing the situation in higher dimension, dimension uh, larger than, than two, and we will focus on the study of the, the Hochschuls themselves, not on bifurcation. So perhaps later we can uh, use um, more, some information we get here to study some bifurcation. But here we, we are con concentrating in understanding geometry of, of Hochschuls. So, uh, we already had a <coughs> have a problem in dimension larger than two because since, for instance, house of dimension of Hochschuls is not always continuous, even in the in the in the infinity topology uh, in dimension uh, larger than two. Indeed, uh, what happens is that. Uh, a stable Cantor set, so you, you can have a, a Cantor set given by contractions, which can be a stable Cantor set of a Hochschul, which is some, can, can be something like this. We have, uh, let me try to, to make a good picture. We have two things like this. So, yes. So we may have, uh, say, a square which uh, is sent to the interior of, of itself by two contractions, two, say two affine contractions, say F1 and F2. By two rectangles, we have two invariant directions, the horizontal and vertical directions. And the horizontal projections of the, these two uh, of these two uh, rectangles is essentially the, the, is exactly the same interval. So if we iterate this, the, the horizontal projection in, 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 in the limit will be just one point. But if we move a little bit this picture, so this will be a skew product. We'll have a picture like this. So in, in the interval here is, is like, and we have a, two maps which coincide like this. But here we perturb, we have two slightly different maps which slope uh, uh, close to, uh, smaller than one but close to one, uh, much larger than one half. And here we can have a, an invariant interval by a, a set of maps like this. So uh, here by small perturbations, the projection can contain an interval. But here, the projection can be a point, and in the vertical direction, if the contraction is large here, the dimension can be uh, arbitrarily small, so be much smaller than one. So here, we may have a jump of the dimension of the invariant set here from uh, something which is very small, smaller than one half, say, to something which, at, which is at least one, because the projection will contain an interval. So this is a, a rough idea of of an example that there is a family of examples like this. But on the other hand, this is a, uh, this example is very special because I have two, two, two affine maps. Uh, so you have a, a skew product such that the, the, the projections are the same interval exactly. So the same map. And so this is, this seems to be n n n not a generic phenomenon. But anyhow, the, the house of dimension of, of Hochschuls in, in, in dimension larger than three uh, is not always continuous, but it's a reasonable question to ask whether it's uh, generically continuous. And, well, well, in a joint work with uh, Jacques and Marcel, in order to understand better homoclinic bifurcations uh, in dimension larger than two, we introduced uh, 
a, a fractal invariant, so a fractal dimension which we call the uh, upper uh, uh, stable dimension, and analogously we have an upper unstable dimension associated to the unstable counter set, uh, which now we, uh, we generalize it. We, we will, uh, so I will present a family of, uh, of fractal dimensions, of new fractal dimensions, all of them will be uh, upper bounds for, for the true house of dimension of, of the stable counter sets. We have the same things for the unstable counter sets. So, yeah, so the idea is to work with uh, vertical cylinders. So we have a horseshoe, and in the horseshoe we have. We have an initial Markov partition, and we have some vertical cylinders, and I'm not good at drawing things, but let's try to. So how is the typical picture in the, in the square? So in the square, we have, say, uh, some horizontal strips. In the easiest case, I have two horizontal strips, which are sent to, to vertical strips like this. So the vertical cylinders are, correspond to these vertical strips, are images. And we have, uh, say this, horizontal strips like this. OK. OK, when, when we iterate the dynamics uh, here or here, we will have a large number of, uh, of very thin but an exponentially large number of vertical cylinders. So we have a lot of, lot of small vertical cylinders. Well, the geometry of vertical cylinders, well, they are thin. So if you take uh, a cross section here, the, so the, the, the volume of the cross section is always uh, exponentially small. Indeed, the volume does not change much. So there is a bounded distortion of the volumes, but the shape of the cross-section in principle can change a lot. So you may have some cross-sections looking like a, a circle and other cross-sections look like a very distorted ellipses, for instance. And we need to control this. So we need some, some lemmas that show that for most cylinders, the, we have a reasonable, reason, reasonably good control of the distortion between uh, cross sections. But what we do to, in order to estimate the dimension of the, so in general, the holonomy, if you take two cross sections uh, in, in the final thing, you no, know, we take a, a, a stable, Manifold, two stable manifolds. We have here two cantor sets. And we have a, a holonomy. But in general, the holonomy is only Hiller continuous, not, not in general even Lipschitz. So in principle, the house of dimension can be very different of the two cantor sets. The idea is that so we, we want to understand regular cantor sets, which are intersection between. Uh, of the horseshoe uh, with local stable manifolds. And if, if you consider a set of vertical cylinders of some, uh, of some step of the construction of the horseshoe, they give natural dynamical coverings of, of regular cantor sets. So here we have a dynamical covering. And here we have a corresponding dynamical covering by the same cylinders, but the, the section of, of uh, a, a cylinder here and here can, can, can have different shapes. So here we can have a circle and here a distorted ellipsis. So the, the holonomy a priori is not, is not very good. So, so it's only, only held. OK. Uh, OK, but we, we have these vertical cylinders. And the idea is to each cylinder, we take this, the uh, for, so let, let, let's uh, recall what was the upper stable dimension 
we introduced earlier with uh, Jacques and Marcelo. Uh, in this case, we, we consider the, just the diameter of this, of, 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 this, of this vertical cylinder. For each cylinder, we intersected with local uh, stable manifolds. Uh, we computed the diameter of this intersection and took the supremum of this diameter over the whole vertical cylinder. So take the maximum diameter over the cylinder. And well, th this gives a, say an, a, a, an upper bound for, uh, for, for a covering because in, in, each, uh, uh, in each local stable manifold you have a covering by, well, we may replace the species by a ball uh, whose uh, diameter or whose radius uh, is this maximum diameter here. So we, we have a covering uh, which gives an, an, an upper estimate for the, uh, so for, for, for the dimension at this level. The idea is that if we take this diameter, so the, this is indeed the, the, the maximum diameter, PS1, here we take the first singular value of the derivative, which gives essentially the diameter. So we take the maximum diameter. Uh, so this is a dimension formula. Uh, you compute the exponent such that the sum is equal to one. This gives an, uh, an upper estimate for the uh, house of the dimension, and indeed for the box dimension of all the uh, the stable control sets at the same time. Well, in general, if the dimension is larger, if the dimension of a regular control set is larger than one, uh, we need to, to, to do uh, better. Well, this is a good estimate for the house of the dimension if the dimension of the stable control sets is smaller than one. Uh, indeed, it's possible to prove that typically if the stable dimension is smaller than one, then uh, this upper stable dimension will typically coincide with the house of dimension uh, of, the, of the stable control sets, which will be indeed the, the same for, for all leaves. For, indeed, for typical Hochschule, where we need some extra results that will come later. But indeed, uh, uh, so the... the at the end of the, the story, uh, uh, this first or this original upper stable dimension, the upper unstable dimension, are very, uh, not only are, are, are good upper estimates, they are uh, technically simpler to, to compute than house of dimension, where we need to consider arbitrary coverings by uh, small balls. No? Uh, and indeed, typically, they coincide with half of dimension. They are always an upper bound for half of dimension, and they coincide with half of dimension, provided the half of dimension is smaller than one. But if the half of dimension is larger than one, then we need to refine this dimension. And we do, do this here. We need to work. What happens is that uh, we are dealing with non-conformal uh, dynamical systems. So, Typically, a slice of a, a vertical cylinder do not look like a, a let's begin with, that, that, say, dimension three, when the stable uh, manifold has dimension two. So uh, a slice of a vertical cylinder looks like a, a, an ellipse, which, which is typically not a circle. It's typically like a very distorted ellipse like, like, like that. So we have a lot of ellipses like that. And what we do when we, we we consider these coverings by balls with the same diameter is that we are replacing the ellipses by balls with the same diameter. Uh, apparently, we are losing information, but this, this is good provided the dimension is small. So if the whole set is small, it projects uh, typically to a set of dimensions smaller than one, then this is a good strategy. But if the dimension is larger than one, then it's better to cut the ellipses in smaller, uh, in, in smaller pieces along the, to begin with, along the direction of the second uh, largest, uh, uh, or, or along the second smallest contraction. The, the, 
So the diameter is in the direction of the smallest contraction. And here we will look to the direction of the second smallest contraction. And the second idea is to cover this by, by uh, so you divide uh, in one extra direction and, and consider coverings like this. Uh, so the second, uh, the DN2, for instance, will take the, the two first singular values of the derivative, so lambda 1 and lambda 2. And the, the idea is that this uh, PS2, for instance, uh, is the product of the, the first two uh, singular values. The, so we have, in general, a formula. So what happens? If the, uh, we do an inductive de definition. If the SJ of lambda is smaller than J, then we, 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 we stop. So, so it's here. If, if the SJ of lambda is smaller than J, say, in the case J equal to one, we discussed this. If the dimension is smaller than one, then all the dimensions will be the same. It will be the S1, which is the upper stable dimension. We, we are happy all the dimensions for all all J will be the S1. If the dimension, so uh, if the S1 is larger than 1, then we will consider the S2. And what, what will be the S2 in this case? Well, uh, we'll do this. We'll take each piece and divide. So each piece is, is essentially like a rectangle, uh, lambda 1 times lambda 2. And we take uh, covering by, say, Lambda 1 over lambda 2 uh, squares of size lambda 2. And what is the estimate for the dimension? It's something like sum over lambda 1 over lambda 2 times lambda 2 to the dimension s should be equal to 1. So this can be uh, written sum of lambda 1 times lambda 2 s minus 1 equal to 1. Or sum of lambda 1... Uh, uh, 2 minus s, lambda 1, lambda 2, s minus 1, equal to 1. And indeed, in, in general, uh, we can write these things. And this lambda 1, lambda 2, this is p1. So this is sum of pi 1, 2 minus s, pi 2, s minus 1, equal to 1. This corresponds to this formula uh, with j equal to 1. Yeah, so pi 1. Uh, to minus s, well, s here is this d. So d is defined to, to be the value of s such, such that this sum is equal to 1. And, well, then we take uh, uh, iterates of this. We take coverings by cylinders of uh, higher steps of the construction. And in the limit, well, we show that the limit always exists, and this defines this family uh, of upper stable dimensions. So, all these dimensions are uh, refined estimates for the true Hauser dimension of the Hochschule. Uh, all of them are larger than the Hauser dimension. And what we, we expect uh, is that uh, at the end, the, 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 the last one should be typically equal to the Hauser dimension. And indeed, uh, we prove this. So the main, the main theorem is that uh, well, at, at the end, that typically the SK will coincide with HD, but at, at but at this point, the the main theorem is that for a typical Hochschule, we may find a sub Hochschule with almost the same uh, upper dimensions, which we defined here, uh, which has. Uh, strong stable foliations of all the dimensions we want. So, well, f first we have this remark that all these dimensions are upper bounds for the house of dimension and indeed for box dimension. So, if some of this dimension is smaller than for some R, that the R dimension is smaller than R, then uh, if you take a C1 image of uh, any uh, stable Cantor set, 
to the Euclidean, uh, uh, to, to a manifold of dimension R or to the Euclidean space of dimension R, the image will have zero Lebesgue measure. We will have, in this house of dimension, at most this number, which is smaller than R. So if you want that, the, that some projection to an Euclidean space of dimension R or to a manifold of dimension R to have non-empty non interior, for instance, then necessarily the dimension should be at least R. So this is a necessary condition. And we prove some results under the hypothesis that this dimension is larger than R. OK. So, so what is the statement of this result? This result gives, so uh, a general Hochschule is a mess. Because we may have points of uh, periodic points with complex eigenvalues, where locally, uh, uh, if you take, so if you look locally to the cylinders that are converging to, the, to this point, they, they converge like, uh, like circles or, or like spheres. And in, in, in other points, you may have real eigenvalues where you are tending to the points like uh, exponentially deform an ellipsis, etc. So the geometry of a Hochschule is not uh, homogeneous at all, if, if, you, if you take a, a general Hochschule. Uh, what this result tries to do is to replace a general Hochschule by uh, a more homogeneous object without losing uh, much uh, mass in some sense, without losing much information on the geometry. So the statement is that given a typical uh, dissipative Hochschule, uh, we may find a sub Hochschule with essential, with almost the same fractal dimensions and which has uh, strong stable foliations of, of all co-dimensions. So uh, for which there are no uh, periodic points with complex eigenvalues, so all, all the eigenvalues are real and are quite different. They have a largest eigenvalue, then a second largest eigenvalue, then a third largest eigenvalue, and they have uh, dominated the compositions of, of all uh, intermediate dimensions. So, so, the, so this theorem says that we, we may uh, find a, a sub uh at least for a perturbation. Of course, we can begin with a very conformal object, but for a typical C infinity perturbation, we may find a sub with almost the same fractal dimensions and with good foliations, good strong stable foliations. Uh, and, and strong stable foliations live inside the stable leaves. And the good news is that the strong stable foliations which live inside st st stable leaves are differentiable, are at least C1 plus epsilon for some positive epsilon. And they will be important in the, in the sequel. So the idea is to use this structure. Now we'll begin with a, a Hochschule. And now what I can do in the remaining time is to give a very impressionistic view of, of what happens is to begin with a Hochschule uh, with these uh, strong stable foliations uh, and put a, a reasonable hypothesis on the dimension. So we assume that, say, the stable counter sets have the natural dimension larger than R, so the earth uh, uh, fractal dimension we introduced before, the earth upper stable dimension is larger than R. In particular, uh, this holds when the house of dimension is larger than R. Uh, if you assume this, then typically uh, we have what is called a, uh, an air codimensional blender. So, we will show that perhaps after a small C infinite perturbation, the images of stable counter sets by typical C1 maps to the earth dimensional uh, Euclidean space. Uh, sorry, here is, is R, and it should be R. So the typical C1 maps to R dimensional manifolds persistently should have non-empty uh, interior. So if you have enough dimension, if, if uh, your, your uh, stable counter sets have house of dimension larger than R, then typical images uh, by C1 maps to 
manifolds of dimension R should have non empty interior. Uh, I miss this, this, this correction. Here is R. OK. So th this is a generalization of the uh, previous work with uh, Wallerstone Silva. It comes from Wallerstone Silva thesis, also known as Zulu. Uh, and well, we begin with these this foliations. And the idea is to introduce a compact recurrent set criterion. So we have the notion of renormalization operator uh, in this context. The idea is that we have a wall here. This H is a wall. Here we have a lot of uh, stable leaves. No? We have the stable leaves of the horseshoe. Uh, the wall is, is something uh, whose intersection with each stable leaf has dimension R. So it's transver transversal to the codimension R strong stable foli foliation. So locally, it's look, it looks like uh, a manifold of dimension R times the unstable Cantor set. <laughs> OK. And the renormalization operator uh, goes from H to H. The idea is that we take a point in this wall. Uh, it intersects. So there is a small piece of, the, of this stable set here. Uh, we take a backwards iterate by the dynamics. Uh, since the dynamics contracts in the stable leaves, the backward interest expands. Uh, but we, we have this invariant uh, uh, foliation. So the leaf uh, through this point will be sent to another leaf there. So the, the leaf through this, this piece, the intersection of the leaf with this piece will go to a leaf there. And this leaf corresponds to a new point in the wall which is the renormalized, the, the image by the normalization. So each small piece uh, of the construction of the stable control set gives rise to a renormalization operators. There is a lot of possible renormalization operators, each corresponding to a cylinder, say, or to a, a piece of the construction of a control set. And a compact recurrent set, well, is a compact set contained in the wall, such that for each point in the control set, at least, there is at least one renormalization operator that goes to the interior of the control set. And we say that a function satisfies the compact recurrent criterion uh, if the, there is a compact recurrent set. So, the, the, well, this is an open condition. I have no time to, to explain. But the, the, the theorem is that the compact recurrent criterion is sufficient to imply uh, the, the presence of a, a error dimensional blender. So it implies that uh, any, any manifold close to, to a leaf of the strong stable foliation, C1 close to a leaf, uh, persistently intersects the unstable lamination of the horseshoe. This implies, in particular, that the image of stable cantor sets by differential bound maps uh, contain open sets. And the main theorem after that is that, indeed, uh, for most horseshoes with, with upper stable dimension larger than R, indeed, there is a, 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 they have a recurrent compact. Uh, they satisfy the recurrent compact uh, criterion. So, uh, they are erco dimensional blenders. So we show that erco dimensional blenders are typical among uh, horseshoes. We, we'd have some, some, some chance of, of being a per dimensional blender. We have enough dimension. So the uh, stable counter sets must have dimension larger than R. And if the upper stable dimension is larger than R, then typically the, the, the horseshoes are uh, R dimensional. Uh, blenders, and well, in order to prove this, we use a version of Erdos probabilistic method that, uh, unfortunately, uh, I have done no time left to, to explain, but the, the idea is to construct a family of perturbations with a very large number of parameters and to show that for most parameters, uh, we, we create a recurrent compact set. We use a general version of Maxson's theorem to construct a good candidate 
for a recurrent compact set, and we proved that this good candidate works for most small perturbations of this family of perturbations with a very large number of parameters. Well, a very impressionistic uh, description of the argument, but I, I, I try to, to explain a little bit the, uh, the, the, the geometry of so, so the, this family of dimensions and the, the structure. So, so the, there are these two, two parts of the, the work. We restrict the, the study to horseshoes which have uh, dominated the compositions in all, in all dimensions which are relevant to, to this work. And then we, we do something in some sense similar to this joint work with Yokoz, and which extends this uh, joint, the, the first results with, with uh, Zulu, with Wellstone Silva. And there are a lot of technical things that I have no time to explain. So thank you very much for <laughs> <laughs>